trying to get things set up here for you. Lot of information for you today. Um, as you can see, this case has uh, generated a tremendous uh, response from the public, and uh, there's just been an overwhelming amount of evidence. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank Jaime Masson for, for helping us today with that. <clears throat> the sun revolves around the earth. The world is flat. He'll never fly. We'll never get to the moon. It never happened. Narrow-minded concepts have been with us since time immemorial. What kind of world should we expect if those that fear the truth and cling to disinformation for dread of change bend our hearts and our minds to their ideals? What can be said of ourselves if we allow those that want to keep the truth from us to succeed? There are people that wish to strip us all of our rights and our freedoms and to take from all humanity peace and prosperity. Many have bled and died for our rights to speak for people like Dr. Jonathan Reed, whose only wish is to tell of what happened to him. Yet there are those who clearly desire to keep him and others like him from the right to freedom of speech. Some self-proclaimed researchers and armchair contactees who spout diatraps concerning individual rights. When it comes to certain cases they are not comfortable with, well then suddenly, individual rights don't matter anymore. Now more than ever, we must come together as a community to protect the rights of others. If we do not, the many of our men and women have sacrificed their lives for nothing. In the efforts of some to make a name for themselves, they ride the coattails of high-profile cases. If they can't be a part of it, then they will attempt to destroy it in the interest of gaining fame through the destruction of others. It is a very sad truth, but it is a truth, and unfortunately one all too common in the field of ufology. Betty and Barney Hill, Travis Walton, Willie Strieber, Dr. Jonathan Reed, as well as others, have suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous accusations. These people have suffered traumatic events, and instead of being greeted with understanding by some, they are met with hostility. What constitutes evidence in this phenomenon? It seems an ever-changing hurdle for one to jump. We have heard statements by others to the effect of, the picture is too clear, it's too fuzzy. Too much evidence, not enough evidence. They have too much, so it must be a government conspiracy. On the other hand, they say, there is no government conspiracy. If you believe in the UFO ET phenomenon, then it follows that you must accept that there is suppression of this information. And yet many have a difficult time understanding that a shadow government is responsible for this. As to the general criteria for determining evidence, it is impossible to fill. It's either too much, therefore conspiracy. Not enough, so not true. Too clear, not clear enough, on and on. This case is not smoking gun evidence, no. It's habeas corpus evidence. Hard evidence in the form of the link artifact and blood samples. There's video and photographs, as well as numerous witnesses and documentation. Some treat experiencers, like second-class citizens, intentionally abandoned by society rather than as people who have experienced something truly unique. What makes an experiencer? A moment of incredible circumstances 
that defies the normal, accepted concepts of daily life. A person that simply sees or comes in contact with something unique. Or is it just the unusual circumstances of being in the right place at the wrong time? The truth is that we can all be experiencers. If we just open our eyes and our hearts to see what is truly going on around us. And being here and listening to those that have actually experienced something amazing, we take an important step in our journey that leads to a new reality. After all, aren't we all searching for the next step? I met Jonathan about four years ago. Jonathan at that point had been through a terrifying experience, one that left him emotionally spent and on the verge of suicide. He had been living in a second-hand car and upon losing that, he had to survive the streets alone in an emotional despair, a fugitive being hunted down for what he had seen. Some sympathetic people had taken him off the streets and put him up in a hotel where they rescued him from taking his own life. A month later, I received a phone call, one that would change my life forever. That phone call was the start of my involvement in this case. It would take some time and hardships to build the trust between us, the trust that was needed in order to document the case and extract all the issues that had taken place. Jonathan at this time was only a shell of a man. He had lost much of his will to live. Even though he had come a long way, he still remained fractured and terrified. He was suffering from some kind of post-traumatic stress. I had seen this many times in many of the Vietnam vets that I had come to personally know throughout my life. Jonathan wanted me to chronicle the events that had happened to him in the October of 1996. It would be a monumental undertaking. We had taken from 1,500 pages of notes to complete the task. The hardest part for me was in having Jonathan relive the hellish nine days over and over again. Such was the man's desire and courage for the world to know of what happened to him, that he was willing to suffer through the memories of all he had gone through and lost. I am here to tell you that in the view of what I have seen, the horrors, of the loss of life, that men like Jonathan and others are very precious treasures and no one has a right to emotionally dissect this man no one thank you <clears throat> Jonathan spent days in bed unwilling to face the outside world a world that betrayed him before any of this he was living what some would call the American dream. Now his erratic behaviors and feral-like actions mirror that of an animal that had been beaten and severely abused. Obsession and paranoia now seem to drive his existence. At times he would shake uncontrollably and suffered from frequent vomiting. Jonathan couldn't sleep or eat for days on end. Circumstances aside, this man was devastated, suffering from deep-rooted paranoia. I spent many days working with and counseling Jonathan. It would be months before he would be willing to walk outside again. Jonathan was determined to survive and reach, reach, to reach the world with his reality. In my observation, one of the key elements that kept this man alive was his indomitable will. 